Greetings, fellow aliens. Welcome to the 16th episode of Earthlings 101. This is the first of two episodes about the development of Earthling civilizations. Today we will follow the development of Earthlings up to the first cities. In the next episode, we will continue our journey to the present day. In this picture, we see the most dangerous superpredator ever to roam the surface of this planet. Those beasts swarmed whole continents like locusts. Wherever they appeared, dozens of species of large animals were hunted to extinction. Alongside, you see a Smilodon, a large saber-toothed cat. The predator is of course the earthling, Homo sapiens. The species emerged about 300,000 solar cycles ago in a continent called Africa. By the way, it's Homo sapiens, not Homo sapien. Just saying. Homo sapiens lived a nomadic lifestyle, picking berries and roots, fishing, hunting small animals and the occasional big beast. Earthlings are lousy sprinters, but even today, they are amongst the best long-distance runners on the planet, and can hunt down just about any animal, meep, meep. at least on a hot day. <laughs> Scientific advice. When you put a fast-running animal like a gazelle onto a virtual reality treadmill and have it run for its life, you'll notice that its body temperature will rise. After a while, it will have to stop to cool down. Not so earthlings, they can sweat all over their hairless skin, which cools the body and prevents overheating even when running long distances. If you know anything about robotics or bioengineering, you know that brain power generates a lot of heat, the smarter a brain is, the more cooling it requires. So, maybe the earthlings efficient sweat cooling system, was not only useful for hunting, but also enabled them to develop such a powerful brain. While Homo sapiens took over Africa, at least two other human species were spreading in other parts of the world, the Denisovan in East Asia, and the Neanderthals in Europe. All three species had a common grandfather, Homo erectus, who had lived in Africa, and parts of Eurasia. People imagine Neanderthals as stupid brutes, but their brains were actually bigger than the ones of Homo sapiens. They were rather good at creating clothes to affront the cold, and they needed that, at the time, large parts of the northern hemisphere were covered by frozen hydric acid, also known as ice. Because of all this liquid trapped in glaciers, the whole planet was awfully dry. So, the map we saw before should rather look like this, with ice sheets and slightly larger land masses. But back to Homo sapiens. Around 200,000 solar cycles ago, they had spread over parts of Africa. We don't know where exactly, but remains have been found in Morocco and Ethiopia. In the following 80,000 cycles, the climate got worse, and at one point the species was nearly driven to extinction, we can see that on the genetic record. But somewhere they survived, possibly in South Africa. The climate got better, so good, in fact, that even the Sahara became a wet and fertile region, and earthlings spread again over the whole continent. Some even ventured into Southwest Asia, but not further. Odds are they were stopped by the Neanderthals. Actually, let's give earthlings in different regions of the world typical but totally anachronistic headgear, for easy identification. Don't take them too seriously, this is not a video about the global history of hats. Anyway, about 70,000 solar cycles ago, earthlings in Africa were seized by wanderlust and started migrating east. One group went along the coast and populated India, and Southeast Asia, while another group migrated from Africa to Southwest Asia. About 50,000 solar cycles ago, they somehow crossed the sea to Australia, long before the invention of weaving, hence without fabric sails. Nobody really knows how they did this. At the time, Australia was a paradise for large animals. Predatory kangaroos taller than men, large marsupial lions, hippo-sized wombats, giant flightless birds, seven-meter-long lizards, you name it. Some thousand solar cycles after the earthlings arrived, they were all gone. It's not difficult to figure out what happened to them, the earthlings ate them. But earthling expansion didn't stop there. Around 40,000 solar cycles ago, they migrated to China and to Europe. Another group took off from Southwest Asia to Central Asia, where the ice was receding. They arrived 10,000 cycles later. In Europe, there wasn't as much megafauna left to extinguish, because the Neanderthals had gotten there first. 
so they extinguished the Neanderthals instead. Not all of them, though, some traces of their genes remain in modern Earthlings' DNA. Meanwhile, in Asia, their Denisovan cousins encountered a similar fate. About 31,000 solar cycles ago, a surgeon in Borneo performed the first known successful leg amputation on a teenager. The patient went on to live for another six to nine years. About 23,000 solar cycles ago, somewhere in Central Asia, a hunter made friends with a wolf, the first domesticated animal, ancestor of the dog. Meanwhile, Europeans discovered that you can form clay into any shape you want, and then harden it in a fire. This is called pottery. They used this technique to create little figurines of fat women with large breasts. Earthling scientists think those figurines were cult objects. I think it is a prehistoric form of porn. Roughly at the same time, as Earthlings reached eastern Siberia, both Asian and European Earthlings started getting paler skin. Dark skin is great when you need protection from a tropical sun. But where there is less sun, white skin is better for vitamin D production. At that time, the American continent was still untouched by Earthlings. The ancestors of horses, donkeys and zebras had come from North America, as well as the ancestors of camels, dromedaries and llamas. Descendants from both species still lived there, alongside dire wolves, giant tortoises, bear-sized beavers, and sloths larger than elephants. They enjoyed their happy human free life, until one day, 16,000 solar cycles ago, earthlings crossed the land bridge to Alaska. Within a thousand years, the earthlings had populated the whole American continent. Guess what happened to those large animals? By the way, Australia and North America are not the only continents where megafauna was extinct for dinner. Similar fates happened to the woolly mammoth, the giant armadillos of South America, the woolly rhino, the African giant buffalo and many others. No other species has so efficiently depopulated whole continents. Except for, the microbes. <laughs> now we are around 15,000 solar cycles ago, the ice is receding, and humans have reached just about every habitable corner of the planet. Everybody is still hunting, gathering and fishing. But the climate keeps getting warmer and, more importantly, wetter. The table is set for the game of civilization, the cards are distributed, and everybody is ready. Let the game begin. Earthlings have a reputation for having the best ideas where they defecate. This might have been the case for the idea that kicked off the biggest step forward in human history. It happened in Southwest Asia, in a region called the Fertile Crescent, roughly 11,000 solar cycles ago. Maybe some earthling came back to an old latrine, and while they were doing their business, they discovered wild wheat growing in the dirt. They concluded that some undigested seed in their bowels must have grown to full ears. Then they started to experiment. They found out that grains grow best in excrement. But you can make it grow in normal soil when you loosen the soil with a stick before seeding. Some years later, the whole band of hunters and gatherers had a little wheat field to which they would come back every now and then to seed, look after the plants, or harvest, just as security, as an additional food source. After some decades, the whole tribe would be doing the same. Digging the soil over was hard work, but they harvested more grain than ever before. Somebody realized that wheat is even better digestible when you crush it, mix it with water and bake it. This is called bread. Remember pottery, the technique of baking little pawn figures out of clay. Now they learned that they could also shape clay vessels, to transport and store all the wheat they were harvesting. All that wheat meant that there was less need for hunting and gathering elsewhere. But sometimes the fields got devastated by animals, or the harvest was eaten by other earthlings. Therefore they built huts so they could stay nearby, tend to the crops and prevent other earthlings from eating them. That's when earthlings developed a new concept, private property. The earthlings who created a crop field owned the field, and nobody else was allowed to eat the crop, unless the owner gave it to him. Sometimes this was done in exchange for something else, like farming tools or pottery. This is called barter. However, before the invention of money, barter was less common than people used to think, early societies often relied on gifts and gratitude, a concept I explained in episode 7. To keep other earthlings and animals out, earthlings built fences around the fields. Somebody realized that fences are also an excellent way to keep animals in. So they put a fence around a grass field and placed some wild goats inside, so they had milk and meat. They discovered that they could get more docile goats by selective breeding, and bigger wheat seeds by selective sowing. This is called domestication. 
It wasn't long until they domesticated pigs and sheep and cultivated barley, figs, flax and peas. Flax isn't edible, it's a fiber crop, it yields material for creating ropes and baskets. It wasn't used for clothing yet, earthlings had yet to figure out how to spin yarn and weave textiles. One problem was small food rivals like mice and rats, who often stole grain. But earthlings domesticated an animal called cat, to get rid of those pests. Although, when you observe earthlings and their cats, you might wonder who domesticated whom. Strategic advice. A common tactic used by invaders is to infest the target planet with combat parasites, small stealthy critters that hide in the shadows and then latch onto the targets. If you do so, beware of cats, they will probably make quick work of your critters. Far away, in China, other earthlings were growing rice and millet and also raising pigs. Then, around 10,000 years ago, earthlings in both China and the Fertile Crescent hit the jackpot, cattle, a horned herbivore, a cousin of giraffes, hippos and whales. Female cattle are docile and give milk. The males are rather wild but become docile when you cut their testicles off, and then they can transport objects, or pull the sticks earthlings use to loosen the soil. When you kill them, they yield a lot of protein. And last but not least, they literally produce shitloads of fertilizer. In other words, they are like heavy agricultural robots which also produce milk, fertilizer, meat, leather, as well as more robots. Since then, the sweet smell of fresh cow dung has accompanied agricultural activities all over the planet. Even today, this fragrance is a surefire sign that you are in a food-producing area. Earthlings call this country air. What do you think, how much cow dung is produced on Earth every day? Compare its mass, for example, to a building of your choice. I'll give you the answer at the end of the episode. About 8,000 solar cycles ago, agriculture had spread its sweet scent from the Fertile Crescent to Egypt, India, and Europe, and from China to Southeast Asia. Everybody else was still hunting and gathering. But was agriculture actually an improvement in quality of life? Most earthlings will tell you that it was a transition from a hard struggle for survival to the lazy life of a well-fed agriculturist. But that's actually nonsense, the life of hunter-gatherers was not that bad. Agriculture was a revolution, and after a revolution, earthlings have an urge to convince themselves that the state before was a miserable place. We know today that a Neolithic hunter and gatherer had way more free time and a richer diet than a farmer, who worked his butt off from dawn till dusk. And that doesn't even count the famines after crop failures, the epidemics due to the close contact with animals, the rustlers and thieves, and all the nice achievements of civilization that were yet to come, like overcrowded cities, slavery, war, and tax declarations. Hence the question, why did earthlings become farmers? And, by extension, was civilization a good idea? We will come back to this later on. About 7,000 millennia ago, mankind took its next step towards tax declarations. It happened, again, in Southwest Asia. In the eastern part of the Fertile Crescent, there are two rivers, Euphrates and Tigris. Originally, only the land next to the rivers was arable, but earthlings found a way to irrigate what would come to be called the land between the rivers, Mesopotamia. A hierarchical system of canals distributed water to every field. Next to the rivers, they created villages, as well as orchards and palmaries which require a lot of water. Far from the river, we had pastures for animals, and swamps for fishing. The canals and villages on this map are of course not to scale. Keep in mind that we're talking about an area roughly the size of the islands Hokkaido, Hispaniola or Ireland. This allowed producing way more crops than the farmers needed to eat. However, the irrigation system needed to be organized. So, a new profession was born, bureaucrats. This kicked off a whole new series of professions. To coordinate the bureaucrats, you needed more bureaucrats. To supervise them, you needed managers. To feed them, you needed tax collectors. To punish those who wouldn't pay taxes, you needed law enforcement and judges. To house them, you needed houses. To satisfy the needs and desires of those managers, tax collectors and judges, you needed artisans, merchants, artists and whores. To house all of them, you needed even more houses. To serve them, you needed slaves. To defend all those people and houses against raids, you needed a wall staffed with soldiers. To command those soldiers you needed a general. To justify the whole system, you needed temples and priests. And to rule over the whole mess, you needed the most earthling-like profession of all, a king. And because earthlings are obsessed with things, 
they declared the whole system a thing, and called it a city-state. And because all great things need a name, they called the city Uruk. At the same time, people in South America were still struggling with making agriculture work. But they just had domesticated their first animal, the guinea pig. Hooray! Meanwhile, Uruk extended its influence over the whole region and smaller settlements in it. And of course, Earthlings decided that this region is now a great thing which merits a name, Suma. This was the first kingdom. About a thousand solar cycles later, Earthlings all over Eurasia domesticated new animals, water buffaloes in India and Southeast Asia, ducks in China, honey bees in Europe, and dromedaries in Southwest Asia. Chickens and donkeys had already been domesticated earlier. Americans, however, were still stuck with their guinea pig. There just weren't many domesticable animals around. Dromedaries and their cousins, the camels, can be used for farming, but also as mounts or pack animals, able to cross long distances. This was important because there was a vivid trade going on between different places, and even different civilizations. Roughly around the same time, earthlings in Inner Asia domesticated an animal which would prove even more useful, the horse. Around 5,000 solar cycles ago, Uruk had about 40,000 residents, that's roughly today's population of Monaco. Twice as many were living in the surroundings. Of course, administrating all those people wasn't an easy task. Bureaucrats, tax collectors, and judges need to keep records about, who owned what, who had paid their taxes, and who needed to be punished. So they took notes by making marks on clay tablets. That was the birth of the first scripture, cuneiform. At first just a shorthand for bureaucrats, cuneiform developed into a full-fledged scripture to write down any form of text, from a collection of soup recipes to the first recorded customer complaint, about the quality of copper ingots. At that time, Sumo wasn't the only city-building civilization anymore, similar kingdoms had popped up in South America, the Indus Valley and Egypt. The latter two developed their own writing systems, possibly inspired by cuneiform. It's not a coincidence that cities appeared mainly near great rivers like the Indus, Euphrates and Tigris or the Nile, providing water and serving as transportation ways. You see similar phenomena on all sorts of planets, from cloud cities near humid currents to undersea cities near lava streams. When you observe a large earthling city, it's usually roundish, with a network of roads, near a river and not too far from arable land, and for good reasons. It would be foolish to build, say, a linear city of the size of London in the middle of a desert, far from rivers and arable land, on a 170 kilometers long strip, without streets and only connected by one train line. Even if you could convince or coerce millions of earthlings to live in this giant dark sardine can, they would either die of hunger and thirst, drown in their own waste, die from a rapidly spreading pandemic or trample each other to death. It would basically be the biggest and showiest tomb ever built. Speaking of big showy tombs, when earthlings start building stuff, they easily get build happy and build higher and higher. The Egyptians for example built giant pyramids, without any help from aliens. The question is, why did they do it? Why put so much effort into some seemingly useless buildings? Maybe it was because they could. Or because they thought their empire was eternal. Or maybe, just maybe, they sensed that it was not eternal, and wanted something to remain. Maybe they had a premonition that one day, the empire of the mighty pharaohs would crumble, its glory would sink into the sand, and the remains of its former greatness would end up in that one place where all empires on this planet go after their death, the terminal stop of glory, the Valhalla of dead kings, the elephant graveyard of fallen empires. I'm speaking of course of the British Museum in London. Tips for tourists. If you are a time tourist, you can visit a time when the pyramids were built in Egypt, yet some woolly mammoths were still alive in Siberia. However, please refrain from placing a mammoth on top of a pyramid for a selfie, this is generally frowned upon, and can get you into serious trouble. Now let's pause and come back to the question of why earthlings gave up their lazy forager life and became hard-working farmers and city dwellers. Modern earthlings might see this as the only possible path to a civilized world, as mankind's manifest destiny. But we aliens know that this development is neither inevitable nor irreversible. The Akruxi, for example, were passionate nomadic hunters. But an inexperienced bio-administrator forced them to become farmers, until they got rid of him and returned to their beloved hunting lifestyle. The Aquilarian Arachnids, on the other hand, have built a spacefaring civilization without ever planting a single crop or taming a single animal. Their society relies solely on weaving elaborate webs to catch small airborne organisms. So, 
Why did earthlings abandon their lazy hunter-gatherer life? Early adopters of agriculture might have thought that producing more food means you can eat more, but they soon found out that it actually means you can feed more children. Hunter-gatherers have to carry their children around, which limits their population growth, but settled farmers can and will have as many children as they can feed. But that's exactly the point. The answer lies, as so often, in our old friend, the genetic imperative. Evolution doesn't care whether you are happy, as long as you spread the code. Evolution is a numbers game, when we have three happy foragers on the left side, and eight miserable farmers on the right side, the farmers will win by numbers. And when the farmers get all civilization happy, with irrigation, bureaucrats, tax collectors, soldiers etc., and this allows them to feed even more people, civilization will get the upper hand. Simple as that. In other words, the inherent purpose of earthling civilization is neither to make people happy nor to pursue some higher values of culture and virtue, but to allow earthlings to multiply like Antarian rabbits. And from this point of view, civilization is a huge success. Today, there are almost as many earthlings on earth as there are white dwarfs in the galaxy. As for happiness, culture and virtue, that's due to earthlings' tendency to make the best out of every situation. So I can't tell whether civilization was a good idea, but I have to admit, it made this planet a very interesting place. Before I give you the solution to the cow poo question, a word from our sponsor, Orbital Solutions. Do you have a problem with a great old one? An ancient evil hidden in the ocean, the desert, or the eternal ice? Lurking, dreaming, spreading insanity and terror, waiting to return? Don't wait till the stars are aligned. Call in the professionals. We perform planetary mega pest control all over the galaxy, with telepathic jamming satellites, orbital lasers, and surgical antimatter strikes. We exterminate even the greatest old one with a minimum of collateral damage. Orbital Solutions It's not a moon, it's a space station. Now the answer to the question I asked earlier, modern cattle on Earth produce about 60 million metric tons of poo every single day, that's 10 times the mass of the Great Pyramid of Giza. This was the 16th episode of Earthlings 101. In the next episode, we continue our journey through Earthling history till modern times, and examine why some civilizations developed faster than others. The episode is already online, so you can watch it right away if you want. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, click on the little rocket, and don't forget to be alien.